because it was Communion Sunday, I really wasn't sure what direction to go. And then Troy and I, which Troy and I really probably shouldn't talk before service, but um, it, it never fails. And so I even told him, I said, I really wasn't sure what direction I was going to go. Morning, we're going to, you can go right ahead, that's fine. It may be a little bit loud, but you know, to scare everybody. This morning, we're going to talk about society as a whole and people living in the danger zone. I think it's a, a very important message. So, you guys can all relate to this. <laughs> all right. We had to go back to the 80s and play Danger Zone from Top Gun. I just couldn't have that song not played. So, um, you know, we're living in a generation of what I call, what I don't even call it, it's everybody calls adrenaline junkies. Everybody know what I'm talking about? We're never just satisfied doing things normal. It's, it's, it's about taking it to the next level in a lot of different ways. You might even be one. I think all of us, in one way or a form of fashion, are a little bit of adrenaline junkies. And I say that based on a lot of things that we do as humans. You know, we see it on TV, right? We see it at work. We see adrenaline junkies on the interstate. You know, we see it all over the place. I don't even have to expound on some of it. But, the, you know, we, we see adrenaline junkies at church, too, right? And they don't even realize what they're doing or what they're causing for themselves. You know, but on TV, how many of you watch some of the extreme sports on TV? Anybody watch extreme sports? You know, you can watch a guy on a snowboard. He thinks it's really cool to fly up in a helicopter, drop out of the helicopter and snow, snowboard down a mountain that nobody's ever been on, and he hopes that he makes it. Okay? He's not happy with the life that he's living. He's got to push life to the limits. You know, and then at work, we see people all the time. I, I do, living life as an adrenaline junkie at work. And that's not a good thing. They're pushing their job to the danger zone. The disrespect that they have or the things that they do, the things that they say, the way that they act. They're taking it all the way to a zone that they can maybe never return from, which can be a loss of job. And then as far as that goes, what about the people on the interstate? And we're all going to chime in because we're all going to get in agreement. We know what goes on on the interstate. Texting and driving isn't even the big deal anymore. You know, we've got the DUIs. We've got the texting and the driving. We, I, I seen this the other day, I kid you not, and I drive down the interstate pulling a trailer on a regular basis, and I try to merge in at MacArthur and I-40 at about 7.30. Anybody ever been in that area? Okay, that's a lot of fun, all right? But what really scares me is when I'm on the merge onto I-40 and I look over, and there's a lady with her elbow on the steering wheel and a cigarette in her hand and putting on her makeup. Okay, that is an adrenaline junkie. She's the one that you hear about on the morning drive to work, why there's a traffic tie-up from downtown Oklahoma City all the way to Weatherford because she didn't leave five minutes earlier and finish her makeup before she got there. All right, so then there's people like that all over the world, and I don't even have to expound any further than that. You get the mental picture. But we're going to go in and talk about the adrenaline junkies from church. All right, and everybody's like... I didn't do anything. I'm not saying that you did. All right? And these are the people that live in the danger zone. They push their salvation all the way to the line. All right? And I, I start preaching this this morning because this is where God started to minister to me. Now, that doesn't mean that you're out there taking tequila shots after church at the Mexican restaurant. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the normal things that you hear everybody preach about from a platform as far as you're living in the danger zone, you're sinning like crazy. I'm not talking about those things that you're doing like that. That's between you and God. I'm not up here to judge that. I'm talking about something completely different, and that's where we're going to pick up the message this morning. You know, there people that are testing the limits of their salvation. And I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. And everybody can probably quote this, and it's unfortunate, but I call this a danger zone scripture. This is like the no-fail scripture for everybody living on the edge of their salvation. 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 8. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is... We should all do this in unison, right? Everybody know this? But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. How many of you have ever quoted that scripture? Okay. 
That is probably the biggest danger zone scripture that every Christian learns. It's kind of like when I was a freshman in high school, I took Spanish. How many of you here took Spanish class in high school? Anybody? We learned how to say our name, and then the next thing that we learned as students was all the cuss words in Spanish. (laughs) You have to know those. I mean, and that's what Christians are are born into the kingdom. Okay, well, I know I'm not going to be perfect. Where's my mess up scripture? Because I know I'm going to mess up. Yeah, you're going to mess up. And that's, we, we need to know that we can get back to right standing, but that's not the scripture that you should base your whole Christian walk on. If I confess that I kicked the dog, if I confess and I knew better and I knew better and I knew better and I kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on, that's the danger zone scripture. You need to get to the point where you're not relying on that scripture so much. We need to get to the point when riding a bicycle, how many of you remember training on a bicycle when you were younger? I know it's been a long time for some of us. You know they have these, what are they called? See, I can just make that and everybody knows what they are, right? Right? They're training wheels. If you are 45 years old riding a bicycle down your neighborhood with training wheels on, you're going to get stared at. (laughs) I promise you, you should not be on training wheels at 45. You can accidentally learn how to ride a bike in your 20s. You should even be able to accidentally do better without training wheels in your teens. All right, I remember my sister, when we were in Tulsa, she hadn't learned how to ride a bike. I think she was maybe six or seven. So I took the time to teach her how to ride a bike. Well, we took the training wheels off. That's kind of scary. But without the training wheels off, she never knew that she could do okay. I think you need to put that scripture away for a while. And let's learn to live our Christian lives as God intended us to, to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. I don't think that that Jesus was walking around in his earthly kingdom going, if I confess my sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. No, he walked around in a perfect life. He walked around, and I'm sure he had thoughts. I'm sure he had thoughts, especially the day that they were crucifying him, right? He had thoughts. I, Lord, take me down from here, and they're on their own. I don't want any part of this. They don't deserve it. I'm not walking in love to this generation. And you know, every generation of people since then have had the same thoughts about the younger generation. I have that thought all the time. I'm like, I remember Jesse in youth. I hate youth. I remember so-and-so in Sunday school. I hate little kids. And by the way, I'm going to clarify something that you all have been misled on on Wednesday nights when pastor's preaching. (gasps) And I'm going to give it to you like this. He tells everybody that I hate senior citizens. (laughs) And he tells everybody that I say that I am scared of people in Buicks because they're the older generation. But I'm going to tell you all a misrepresentation of that because when I was 16 and I was learning to drive, My instructor, who shall remain nameless, Pastor Craig, (laughs) said to me, when you are driving down the road, beware of a Buick. Because primarily, Buicks are driven by people that are older, and they have a tendency to bump into things. So that was the teaching that I grew up with. So if I'm going to try to get rid of that religious thinking, it takes a long time to get that bad teaching out. Now, yes, is this generation harder to deal with? It's not an elderly thing. It's not a youthful thing. It's just the generation as a whole. Because we're not teaching them by our lifestyle how to walk in love, how to walk as Christ walked. And so I just needed to clarify that this morning just a little bit because that's like the third time I've heard him preach about that. So I'm just going to set that straight. So anyway, so that was all by opening. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, About two weeks ago, this message is actually uh, stirred up inside of me from things that I was going through. I had a different message this morning because we were doing communion and And God instructed me with this. He said, you can teach anything you want from the Bible, and it all goes back to communion. 
Because without communion, the Bible doesn't make matter anyway. So, about two weeks ago, I found myself really frustrated. All right? Anybody there? Doesn't have to be two weeks ago. It can be ten minutes ago. I don't care. But I found myself really frustrated to the point that I was exhausted. All right? I mean, I was just there. It, I, I didn't know that I had much left in me to give. And you know, that's really hard in the customer service industry to be so exhausted and you don't feel like you have anything left to give. Because when one person says hello to you strangely, you're like, what do you mean by that? You know, you're just, you're just ready to go. You're just like throwing your hands. You know, you want to throw some gang signs and they're not Christian. <laughs> you know, you just want to get all busy up on that and just set them straight. You know, it is so important for you to understand why I need to walk in love because you're pushing that button. Everybody relate. Those that aren't in customer service, you probably have met people at Walmart that have pushed those buttons. Right? Okay, well, what came up in me, and you know, it's really a pretty easy answer, and God told me, he says, well, you're angry. Well, yeah, I can figure that part out. Why am I angry? Right? Well, people were pushing me around. Daily life was pushing me around. Inadimate, non-living things were pushing me around. <laughs> right? Can relate. And I say that because I'm in the construction industry, and people will understand this. I'm minding my own business, putting caulking on a window. And a window falls out and cracks me across the bridge of the head. I'm emptying my trailer at my scrap trailer, and I had to get in a fight with a piece of scrap metal that wouldn't let me go. I and mean, it looked like I was beating up bumblebees in the back of my trailer. <laughs> oh, stupid piece of metal. Mm. I bent that thing good. I am victorious through God. Right? That's the way the devil works. I didn't take the bait when it came to fighting with people. So we're going to go ahead and have your stuff come against you. <laughs> Drill a hole in your finger, get hit with a window. A piece of metal that's trapped. I mean, just everything. Amen. Just whatever he can get to just help you go right to the edge of your salvation. Amen. Get to the danger zone. And this is what God said. He goes, you're having this trouble right now because you left some other things unattended. It's unattended things in your life that cause you to get to this frustration point, to this danger zone you're like, I'm not mad at anybody, but now everybody's making me mad. I'm not in for unforgiveness, but now I'm mad at everybody and I can't even forgive myself. Relatable? Understandable. Anybody ever got an issue, you can come work on the, the metal trailer with me and you can take it out on the metal. And it wasn't even the devil's face I was beating with that metal. It was just the side of the trailer. All right? So... Anything. This morning, you all are, I know y'all are judging me right now. I, I feel it. I feel it. Y'all are getting this mental picture of me standing by myself on the back of a metal trailer, beating this piece of metal half to death. It saved somebody's life. I see how y'all are. So this morning, we want to deal with just one danger zone. And as we're starting to deal with this one danger zone, I want you to keep in mind what Jesus did on the cross for you that brings us back to communion this morning. So turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. And for time's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and start reading. Some of you know the scriptures by heart. There's not a new scripture in the Bible that we can't share. So I'm just going to share what the Lord laid on my heart. This is a testimony slash preaching, so we call it preaching. Call it what you want. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. See, I'm, I'm good with the love one another for a day, but it's that continual thing. You know, you start wearing me down. Monday, I'm usually okay. By Wednesday, it, it's wearing me down quick. I really need church in the morning before I go to work on Wednesday. That would really help out a lot, I think. You know, but then there's days where I'm like, even church isn't going to help. I just need God to come down and kick me. So, anyway... For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Then we're going to read in Luke chapter 6. 
starting in verse 27, and we're going to read through 36. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. I'm still not praying for that piece of metal. Just want to let you know, we're on the outs. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you even get credit? Even sinners can do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. Summarized up, it is not walking in love when the person is easy to love. It is walking in love when they don't deserve your love. When you do that, then you're doing it God's way. When they don't deserve it. How many of you have people in your life you feel don't deserve it? I do. I, I do. I feel that there are people that are not worthy of the love that I have to give. And that's not, to, that's not to be saying it funny. That's the truth. But I have to start treating them as though they're on the same level as those people that I feel deserve it. If I'm going to walk in faith, if I'm going to believe the way that God wants me to believe, if I'm going to jump on a higher level of what God has for me. See, I want to receive what God has for me on the highest level. You know, I don't want to be on this level right here of just salvation, which salvation is great. I want to have every gift that he has to offer me. I have a, um, a Mac computer. How many have Mac computers? Okay, me and Jerry. Um, so those of you that understand that, understand that it's, uh, they're a pain when you first get them. There's a lot of things inside of a Mac that I don't get, but it has a lot of things to offer above the other types of computers. I'm just starting to tap into some of it. Now, I'm not satisfied there, because I go around and ask people, do you have a Mac, do you have a Mac, do you have a Mac? I don't, I don't care if you have a Dell, that doesn't, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not saying that I'm higher than Adele, but my Dell never worked for me the way I wanted it to. And then I'm on this Mac, and it's working less than the Dell did because I don't understand it. But as I've started to get in and dig higher and go on a higher level with this MacBook, it's starting to work for me. And that's the way God has it for you. You can be on this level of salvation, but when you start to open up the book and dig in deeper and find out, hey, how what do you know about God? What do you know about God? Do you have God as a true revelation in your spirit? Do you understand everything that God has for you? Tell me. Teach me. I want to know. I want the highest level of what God has for me. And we can't have that highest level of what God has for us if we're not on this level of walking in love to those that don't deserve it. And that's hard. Because I can give you five names right off the top of the bat that I don't think need love. It's the truth. I mean, that's, you know, if we're going to come to church and we're going to listen, then we need to get the truth. And the truth is there are people that I do not feel deserve my love. And I know you probably feel the same way. And if you ask me on the right day, I can throw that list way out there. I can scroll it out there if you want me to. I don't even know their name, but God, I can do facial recognition. That's them. Right? I know y'all are judging. I still feel it. You didn't think I felt this way, did you? That's why we got the lights off. I don't want to see your faces. I don't want to see the judgment. I can feel it, but I don't want to see it. So, how many of you have things that you are believing for in your life? 
Things that you want God to do for you. Blessings that you want to receive from Him. Financial set free. Healing in your life. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Faith works by love. Yes, hearing for sure, but love. My drill with the drill bit in it works not because I pull the trigger. That does help it, but it works when it has a battery in it. I've, uh, I've joked many times. I had a guy uh, work with me years ago. We had a, I'm, how do you know what a Sawzall is? Anybody know what a Sawzall is? Sawzalls are really cool tools. You know, they, I've got a corded one, but I also had a cordless one. And the cordless one is really funny because the guy that worked with me one time had never really used one. So I said, go get the Sawzall. We're going to cut this. Well, he goes and gets the Sawzall, and he, he starts going like this. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, well, he thought it was like a hacksaw where you do it manually, and I'm like, put a battery in that thing and pull the trigger. Let's get this done. <laughs> you know, but he had no idea. He had no understanding. And so if you don't have an understanding of how faith works, you're going to be like the guy with the, hack, or with the saw thinking you've got to manually do it, and that's not how you get the job done. If you have things that you want in your life, then you've got to walk in love. If you're not walking in love towards me when I've offended you, then you are not getting things done. You have no power in your faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1, If I could speak all languages of earth and of angels, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all of His knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move a mountain, but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my own body, I could boast about it. But if I did not love others, I would have gained nothing. Nothing. How many of you have some mountains in your life? How many of you ever, how many have been to Colorado? All right. I get a vision. This is not a mountain like we have in Oklahoma. These are mountains. And sometimes there are mountains in our life that feel like the Rockies, Right? He's saying if you had enough faith for that mountain to be moved completely. Now, I, I've, I've been to Pikes Peak. That's up there. I cannot imagine being able to physically, with my faith, move that mountain and still be called nothing. Because I did not walk in love. That's how nothing you are. Even if you are that strong in your faith, you're nothing. How many of you want to be a Nothing. Oh, no hands on that one. <laughs> you know, the, the thought that I had um, on the love walk, how many of you, you hear that in church? The love walk. Everybody like the love walk? <laughs> yeah, I, we misuse that in church. Just to be honest with you, we really do. It's when somebody offends us, we go, oh, I'm walking in love. No, you're not. You know how I know you're not? Because you posted it on Facebook. So-and-so made me mad today. And if it's not your name in here, don't worry, it's not you. I'm walking in love. No, the Bible says hardly notices when others do it wrong. If you want to walk in love, pretend like it didn't happen. That's hard to do. How many married people do we have in here? Yeah, love walk. The Bible says... Hardly notices when others do it wrong. That other is my spouse. And I feel like I know that I've been done wrong. Lord, there's some contradiction here. This thing that you have given me has now offended me. Now I feel like I have to walk in love. And now I'm having to use this phrase and misuse it a lot. If you want to get things straightened out, walk up to your spouse and go, I'm walking in love towards you right now. You won't have to walk in love anymore. You'll be limping back. It will be a crawl. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. All good fights in a relationship start with, I'm walking in love towards you. Walking in love reaches out when the person that you are, what are they called, espoused to? Husbands and wives. When you know that that person is having a rough day, you'd better not keep your mouth shut for a few minutes. 
versus let them know that you know they're having a bad day. Just, as Kate McVeigh says, stay in neutral. Neutral can get you a long way when you're rolling downhill. All right? Honey, I know you're going through some things. I love you. Just want to let you know I'm here for you. I know, yes, you did jump me. You broke my hip. You hit me so hard. You know, but that, it's, it's misused. In the church body, love hardly notices when others do it wrong. That does not mean Facebook is bad when it comes to that stuff. It really is. Facebook is for posting, like, uh, desserts and stuff like that. Right? That's where you should find all your good recipes on Facebook. Other than that, <laughs> there's some good barbecue on Facebook. So, anyway, we need to look at people through the cross. Have you ever been to a 3D movie? 3D? Okay, I, 3D doesn't work for me. I have astigmatism in my eyes, but I hear that 3D glasses, when you put them on, the movie comes alive. If you watch that movie without the 3D glasses, it's just kind of like, eh, it's just a movie, right? But you put the 3D glasses on, and the movie just, whoosh, everything's coming out and grabbing you. Well, if you look at people through the cross, the way God intended it, you'll see them through the eyes of love. Still makes it hard because they need to do the same thing. We're not obligated to care about how they do it. We're only obligated to deal with how we deal with it. Jesus looked at us through the work on the cross. He looks at us daily through the cross. Because if it wasn't for the cross, he couldn't even acknowledge us. Today, as we're working towards communion, we need to keep that in mind. We don't deserve communion because we're here in church. We get to partake in communion because of what he's done for us, and this is our way to honor him. And if you guys will start to reflect to our communion as we're moving towards that direction, we're supposed to judge ourselves and how we take care of others and how we deal with others. Now, let's not do the 1 John 1, 9 version of communion today. I knew we were taking communion today, so... I prayed when I came through the door and I laid it all down and then I walk out that door and I'm going to pick it all back up and I'm going to find that guy. Uh-huh. Okay. In closing, we're going to work our way towards communion. How many can deal with that? In Luke chapter 6, now I'm going to share a couple more scriptures and they're only two and a half pages each, so we'll still be a little while. Okay. In Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 37, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over and poured out in your lap. The amount you give will, will determine the amount you get back. Then in Colossians, chapter 1, starting in verse 19, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and your actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truly, this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. See, it's you, you've got to have a full revelation on a daily basis of who you are because of the cross. When you wake up in the morning and you've had a bad night's sleep, you've got to wake up and remind yourself. You've got to convince yourself sometimes to get up and go to work. You've got to convince yourself to stay in a mood. You've got to, not that mood. You've got to convince yourself to walk in love. All right, not the love walk, but you've got to walk in love on a regular basis. 
If you are a person that goes out into this world, you had better figure it out or you're not going to receive the things that God has for you. You can't because he's not a liar. And he's saying that your faith works by your love. Your faith doesn't work by my love. Your faith works by your love. You can stand here and get blessed and set free and honor Christ in communion and walk right out that door and miss all the blessings that God has for you because you fail to walk in love. So in keeping all of that in mind this morning, we're going to go ahead and partake in communion. And, and as we do so, ushers, you can go ahead and come down. And as we do so, the other thing that uh, the Lord laid on my heart was, we've got to get out of the routine. Don't become so routine about communion that it loses its meaning. I could ask Renee this, and she could probably answer. But in law enforcement, there's no such thing as a routine traffic stop. When a police officer just thinks it's just routine, that is the day that he just put his life all the way at the end of his life and is operating in a danger zone that he may not come back from. So you have got to not just be routine about communion. You've got to do it in faith. You've got to operate in love if you're going to receive the blessings that God has for you in communion. So ushers, why don't you go ahead and pass out the elements and then we'll go ahead and read communion together.
Before we start, uh, this is the point where pastor would usually talk about, you know, if you're not a member of the church, that's okay. You're a member of the body of Christ as long as it's, you're saved. So if you would like to take communion today and you're not a member of the church, please do. Don't, don't let that be the reason why you don't honor what was done on the cross that day for us. Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. You could take your bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can partake. I have to chew mine before I go. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may partake. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks in, in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for the opportunity to walk in love towards each other, Father. And we thank you for the love that you you showed us that day on the cross. And we pray, Father, for every person in here that if they have something in their life, Father, that they need to let go of, unforgiveness or towards the others or towards themselves, Father, that they let that go and they see themselves the way that you see them, Father, spotless, blameless, a perfect work, Father, that has started in them. And I thank you for the opportunity, Father, to be the minister of the gospel that is presented this communion this morning and presented your word. And I thank you that as we go today, Father, that there are many that are blessed and they go out today, Father, and they, they seek your will in their life in every aspect and return back here again this evening, Father, to continue the work that has started on this Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you are dismissed. You guys have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Come join us at New Beginnings Family Church, located in Mustang, Oklahoma, at 1615 East State Highway 152. You can find us online on Facebook and YouTube or at walkbyfaith.info. To contact us, call 405-261-6887. And remember, you don't need a second chance. You need a new beginning.